Chapter Nine, Part One of Famous American Statesmen by Sarah Knowles Bolton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ulysses S. Grant, Part One. What Longfellow wrote of Charles Sumner may well be applied to Grant. Were a star quenched on high, for ages would its light, still traveling downward from the sky, shine on our mortal sight. So when a great man dies, for years beyond our ken, the light he leaves behind him lies upon the paths of men. The light left by General Grant will not fade out from American history. To be a great soldier is of course to be immortal, but to be magnanimous to enemies, heroic in affections, a master of self, without vanity, honest, courageous, true, invincible, such greatness is far above the glory of battlefields. Such greatness he possessed, who, born in comparative obscurity, came to be numbered in that famous trio, dear to every American heart, Washington, Lincoln, Grant. Ulysses Simpson Grant was born April 27, 1822, in a log house at Mount Pleasant, Ohio. The boy seems to have had the blood of soldiers in his veins, for his great-grandfather and great-uncle held commissions in the English army in 1756 in the war against the French and Indians, and both were killed. His grandfather served through the entire war of the Revolution. His father, Jesse R. Grant, left dependent upon himself, learned the trade of a tanner, and by his industry made a home for himself and family. Unable to attend school more than six months in his life, he was a constant reader, and through his own privations became the more anxious that his children should be educated. Ulysses was the first-born child of Jesse Grant and Hannah Simpson, who were married in June 1821. When their son was about a year old, they moved to Georgetown, Ohio, and here the boy passed a happy childhood, learning the very little which the schools of the time were able to impart. He was not fond of study, and enjoyed the more active life of the farm. He says in his personal memoirs, While my father carried on the manufacture of leather and worked at the trade himself, he owned and tilled considerable land. I detested the trade, preferring almost any other labor, but I was fond of agriculture, and of all employment in which horses were used. We had, among other lands, fifty acres of forest within a mile of the village. In the fall of the year, choppers were employed to cut enough wood to last a twelve month. When I was seven or eight years of age, I began hauling all the wood used in the house and shops. I could not load it on the wagons, of course, at that time, but I could drive, and the choppers would load, and someone at the house would unload. When about eleven years old, I was strong enough to hold a plow. From that age until seventeen, I did all the work done with horses, such as breaking up the land, furrowing, plowing corn and potatoes, bringing in the crops when harvested, hauling all the wood, besides tending two or three horses, a cow or two, and sawing wood for stoves, etc., while still attending school. For this I was compensated by the fact that there never was any scolding or punishing by my parents, no objection to rational enjoyments, such as fishing, going to the creek a mile away to swim in summer, taking a horse and visiting my grandparents in the adjoining county fifteen miles off, skating on the ice in winter, or taking a horse and sleigh when there was snow on the ground. The indulgent father allowed his son some unique experiences. Ulysses, at fifteen, having made a journey to Flat Rock, Kentucky, seventy miles away, with a carriage and two horses, took a fancy to a saddle horse and offered to trade one which he was driving for this animal. The owner hesitated about trading with a lad, but finally consented, and the untried colt was hitched to the carriage with his new mate. After proceeding a short distance, the animal became frightened by a dog, kicked, and started to run over an embankment. Ulysses, nothing daunted, took from his pocket a large handkerchief, tied it over the horse's eyes, and sure that the terrified creature would see no more dogs, though he trembled like an aspen leaf, drove peacefully homeward. Young Grant was as truthful as he was calm and courageous. He tells this story of himself. There was a Mr. Ralston living within a few miles of the village, who owned a colt which I very much wanted. My father had offered twenty dollars for it, but Ralston wanted twenty-five. I was so anxious to have the colt, that after the owner left, I begged to be allowed to take him at the price demanded. My father yielded, but said twenty dollars was all the horse was worth, and told me to offer that price. 
if it was not accepted i was to offer twenty-two and a half and if that would not get him to give the twenty-five i at once mounted a horse and went for the colt when i got to mr ralston's house i said to him papa says i may offer you twenty dollars for the colt i am to offer twenty-two and a half and if you won't take that to give you twenty-five it would not require a connecticut man to guess the price finally agreed upon i could not have been over eight years at the time this transaction caused me great heartburning the story got out among the boys of the village and it was a long time before i heard the last of it boys enjoy the misery of their companions at least village boys in that day did and in later life i have found that all adults are not free from the peculiarity i kept the horse until he was four years old when he went blind and i sold him for twenty dollars when i went back to maysville to school in eighteen thirty six at the age of fourteen i recognized my colt as one of the blind horses working on the tread wheel of the ferry boat all this time the father was desirous of an education for his child the son of a neighbor had been appointed to west point and had failed in his examinations mr grant applied for his son ulysses he said one day i believe you are going to receive the appointment what appointment was the response to west point i have applied for it but i won't go said the impetuous boy but the father's will was law and the son began to prepare himself he bought an algebra but having no teacher he says it was greek to him he had no love for a military life and looked forward to the west point experience only as a new opportunity to travel east and see the country at seventeen he took passage on a steamer for pittsburgh in the middle of may eighteen thirty nine fortunately the accommodating boat remained for several days at every port for passengers or freight and meantime the curious boy used his eyes to learn all that was possible when he reached harrisburg he rode to philadelphia on the first railroad which he had ever seen except the one on which he had just crossed the summit of the allegheny mountains in traveling by the road from harrisburg he says i thought the perfection of rapid transit had been reached we traveled at least eighteen miles an hour when at full speed and made the whole distance averaging probably as much as twelve miles an hour this seemed an annihilating pace i stopped five days in philadelphia saw about every street in the city attended the theatre visited gerard college which was then in course of construction and got reprimanded from home afterwards for dallying by the way so long i reported at west point on the thirtieth or thirty first of may and about two weeks later passed my examinations for admission without difficulty very much to my surprise a military life had no charms for me and i had not the faintest idea of staying in the army even if i should be graduated which i did not expect the encampment which preceded the commencement of academic studies was very wearisome and uninteresting when the twenty eighth of august came the date for breaking up camp and going into barracks i felt as though i had been at west point always and that if i stayed to graduation i would have to remain always I did not take hold of my studies with avidity. In fact, I rarely ever read over a lesson the second time during my entire cadetship. I could not sit in my room doing nothing. There is a fine library connected with the academy, from which cadets can get books to read in their quarters. I devoted more time to these than to books relating to the course of studies. Much of the time, I am sorry to say, was devoted to novels, but not those of a trashy sort. I read all of Bulwer's then published, Cooper's, Marriott's, Scott's, Washington Irving's works, Lavar's, and many others that I do not now remember. Mathematics was very easy to me, so that when January came I passed the examination, taking a good standing in that branch. In French, the only other study at the time in the first year's course, my standing was very low. In fact, if the class had been turned the other end foremost, I should have been near the head. The years at West Point did not go by quickly only the ten weeks of vacation which seemed shorter than one week in school sometimes at the academy a great general like winfield scott came to review the cadets with his commanding figure says young grant his quite colossal size and showy uniform i thought him the finest specimen of manhood my eyes had ever beheld and the most to be envied i could never resemble him in appearance but i believe i did have a presentiment for a moment that some day i should occupy his place on review although i had no intention then of remaining in the army my experience in a horse trade ten years before and the ridicule it caused me were too fresh in my mind for me to communicate this presentiment to even my most intimate chum 
how often into lives there comes a feeling that there is a specified work to be done by us that no other person can or will ever do when the years were over at west point each four times as long as ohio years young grant was anxious to enter the cavalry especially as he had suffered from a cough for six months and his family feared consumption having gone home he waited anxiously for his new uniform i was impatient he says to get on my uniform and see how it looked and probably wanted my old schoolmates particularly the girls to see me in it the conceit was knocked out of me by two little circumstances that happened soon after the arrival of the clothes which gave me a distaste for military uniform that i never recovered from soon after the arrival of the suit i donned it and put off for cincinnati on horseback while i was riding along a street of that city imagining that everyone was looking at me with a feeling akin to mine when i first saw general scott a little urchin bareheaded barefooted with dirty and ragged pants held up by a single gallows that's what suspenders were called then and a shirt that had not seen a washtub for weeks turned to me and cried soldier will you work no siree i'll sell my shirt first the horse trade and its dire consequences were recalled to mind the other circumstance occurred at home opposite our house in bethel stood the old stage tavern where man and beast found accommodation the stableman was rather dissipated but possessed of some humor on my return i found him parading the streets and attending in the stable barefooted but in a pair of sky-blue nankeen pantaloons just the color of my uniform trousers with a stripe of white cotton sheeting sewed down the outside seams in imitation of mine the joke was a huge one in the minds of many of the people and was much enjoyed by them but i did not appreciate it so highly in september eighteen forty three grant reported for duty at jefferson barracks st louis the largest military post in the united states at that time his hope was to become assistant professor of mathematics at west point and he would have been appointed had not the mexican war begun soon after a new page was now to be turned in the eventful life of the young officer when he was to have as emerson beautifully says of love the visitation of that power to his heart and brain which created all things anew which was the dawn in him of music poetry and art which made the face of nature radiant with purple light the morning and the night varied enchantments when a single tone of one voice could make the heart bound and the most trivial circumstance associated with one form is put in the amber of memory when he became all eye when one was present and all memory when one was gone when the moonlight was a pleasing fever and the stars were letters and the flowers ciphers and the air was coined into song when all business seemed an impertinence and all the men and women running to and fro in the streets were pictures at west point grant's classmate was f t dent whose family resided five miles west of jefferson barracks two of his unmarried brothers says grant were living at home at that time and as i had taken with me from ohio my horse saddle and bridle i soon found my way out to white haven the name of the dent estate as i found the family congenial my visits became frequent there were at home besides the young men two daughters one a schoolmiss of fifteen the other a girl of eight or nine there was still an older daughter of seventeen who had been spending several years at boarding school in st louis but who though through school had not yet returned home in february she returned to her country home after that i do not know but my visits became more frequent they certainly did become more enjoyable we would often take walks or go on horseback together to visit the neighbors until i became quite well acquainted in that vicinity if the fourth infantry had remained at jefferson barracks it is possible even probable that this life might have continued for some years without my finding out that there was anything serious the matter with me but in the following may a circumstance occurred which developed my sentiment so palpably that there was no mistaking it this circumstance was the annexation of texas the probability of a war with mexico and the necessity of leaving jefferson barracks for the texan frontier alas now that days full of hope and the sweet realization of a divine companionship had come they must have sudden ending grant took a brief furlough went to say good-bye to his father and mother and then went to white haven to see julia dent in crossing a swollen stream his uniform was wet through but he donned the suit of a future brother-in-law and appeared before his beloved to ask her hand in marriage to receive her acceptance and then to hasten to the scene of action 
He saw her but once in the next four years and three months, four anxious years to her, when death often stared her lover in the face. As soon as Texas was admitted to the Union, in 1845, the Army of Occupation, as the 3,000 men under General Zachary Taylor were called, advanced to the Rio Grande and built a fort. When the first hostile gun was fired, Grant says, I felt sorry that I had enlisted. A great many men, when they smell battle afar off, chafe to get into the fray. When they say so themselves, they generally fail to convince their hearers that they are as anxious as they would like to make believe, and as they approach danger, they become more subdued. This rule is not universal, for I have known a few men, who were always aching for a fight when there was no enemy near, who were as good as their word when the battle did come on. But the number of such men is small. The first battle was at Palo Alto, meaning tall trees or woods, six miles from the Rio Grande. In the early forenoon of May 8th, Taylor's 3,000 men were drawn up in line of battle, opposed by superior numbers. The infantry was armed with flintlock muskets and paper cartridges charged with powder, buckshot, and ball. At the distance of a few hundred yards, says Grant, a man might fire at you all day without your finding it out. The artillery consisted of two batteries and two eighteen-pounder iron guns, with three or four twelve-pounder howitzers throwing shell. The firing was brisk on both sides. One cannonball passed near Grant, killing several of his companions. After a hard day's fight, the enemy retreated in the night. The war had now begun in earnest, and the man who at the first hostile gun felt sorry that he had enlisted, was ready to brave danger on any field. In the hard-fought battle of Monterey, between 6,500 men under Taylor and 10,000 Mexicans, Grant's curiosity got the better of his judgment, and, leaving the camp, where he had been ordered to remain, he mounted a horse and rode to the front. He made the charge with the men, when about a third of their number were killed. He loaned his horse to the adjutant of the regiment, Lieutenant Hoskins, who was soon killed and Grant was designated to act in his place. The ammunition became low, and to return for it was so dangerous that the general commanding did not like to order anyone to fetch it, so called for a volunteer. Grant modestly says, I volunteered to go back to the point we had started from. My ride back was an exposed one. Before starting, I adjusted myself on the side of my horse furthest from the enemy, and with only one foot holding to the cantle of the saddle, and an arm over the neck of the horse exposed, I started at full run. It was only at street crossings that my horse was under fire, but these I crossed at such a flying rate that generally I was passed and under cover of the next block of houses before the enemy fired. I got out safely without a scratch. When Monterey was conquered and the garrison marched out as prisoners, young Grant was moved to pity, as he says in his memoirs, thus showing a gentle nature, which he bore years later when thousands were falling around him, and he was still obliged to say, Forward. After the capture of Vera Cruz and the surprise at Cerro Gordo, where 3,000 Mexicans were made prisoners, the army advanced toward the city of Mexico. Between three and four miles from the city stood Molino del Rey, the mill of the king, an old stone structure, one story high, flat roof, and several hundred feet long. Sandbags were laid along the roof, and good marksmen fought behind them. Nearby was Chapultepec, three hundred feet high, fortified on the top and on its rocky sides. From the front, guns swept the approach to Molino. Yet, on the morning of September 8th, the assault upon Molino was made, young Grant being among the foremost. The loss was severe, especially among commissioned officers. Grant says, I was with the earliest of the troops to enter the mills, and passing through to the north side, looking toward Chapultepec, I happened to notice that there were armed Mexicans still on top of the building, only a few feet from many of our men. Not seeing any stairway or ladder reaching to the top of the building, I took a few soldiers and had a cart that happened to be standing near brought up, and, placing the shifts against the wall, and chocking the wheels so that the cart could not back, used the shafts as a sort of ladder, extending to within three or four feet of the top. By this I climbed to the roof of the building, followed by a few men, but found a private soldier had preceded me by some other way. There were still quite a number of Mexicans on the roof, among them a major and five or six officers of lower grades, who had not succeeded in getting away before our troops occupied the building. They still held their arms, while the soldier before mentioned was walking as sentry, guarding the prisoners he had surrounded all by himself. 
I halted the sentinel, received the swords from the commissioned officers, and proceeded, with the assistance of the soldiers now with me, to disable the muskets by striking them against the edge of the wall and throwing them to the ground below. Five days after the fall of Molino, Chapultepec was taken with severe loss. Grant was mentioned in the official report as having behaved with distinguished gallantry. Just before the city of Mexico fell into our hands, Grant was made first lieutenant. Promotion had not come rapidly. It is sometimes better if success does not come to us early in life. To learn how to work steadily day after day, with an unalterable purpose, to learn how to concentrate thought and willpower, how to conquer self through failure and hope deferred, is often essential for him who is to govern either by physical or moral power. After Mexico fell, and General Scott lived in the halls of the Montezumas, he controlled the city as a Havelock or a Gordon might have done, and Grant learned, by observation, the best of all lessons for a soldier, to be magnanimous to a fallen foe. He learned other valuable lessons in this war, made the acquaintance of the officers with whom he was to measure his strength in the most stupendous war of modern times, twenty years later. When the Treaty of Peace was signed between our country and Mexico, February 2nd, 1848, whereby we paid $15 million for the territory ceded to us, Grant obtained leave of absence for four months. One person must have been inexpressibly thankful that his life had been spared. Four years, and she had seen him but once. How noble we often become by the mellowing power of circumstances which prevent our having our own way. Discipline may be only another word for achievement. U.S. Grant and Julia Dent were married August 22, 1848, when he was twenty-six, and began a life of affection and helpfulness, which grew brighter till the end came on Mount McGregor. There was reason why the affection lasted through all the years. In the best sense, they lived for each other. Those who find their happiness outside the home are apt to find little inside the home. Devotion begets devotion, and men and women must expect to receive only what they give. Affection scattered produces a scanty harvest. The winter of 1848 was spent at the post of Sackett's Harbor, New York, the next two years at Detroit, Michigan. In 1852, Grant was ordered to the Pacific Coast, and now the young husband and wife must be separated, she to go to her home in St. Louis, and he to the then unsettled West. When Aspinwall was reached, the streets of the town were a foot under water, in a blazing tropical sun. Cholera broke out among the troops, as it had among the inhabitants, and a third of the people died. The crossing of the Isthmus of Panama, on the backs of mules, was tedious and trying. San Francisco was reached early in September. The gold mining fever was at its height. Soon, the troops passed up to Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, and a quiet and dull life began. Measles and smallpox were killing the Indians so rapidly that the gun of the white man was superfluous as an agent of destruction. In 1854, six years after Grant's marriage, despairing of supporting his wife and two children on the Pacific coast with his pay as an army officer, he resigned. His prospects now were not bright. Without a profession, save that of arms, he was to begin, at thirty-two, a struggle for support, which must have tested the affection of the woman who married the young officer in her hopeful girlhood. She owned a farm in St. Louis, and thither they moved as their home. He says of the farm, I had no means to stock it, a house had to be built also. I worked very hard, never losing a day because of bad weather, and accomplished the object in a moderate way. If nothing else could be done, I would load a cord of wood on a wagon and take it to the city for sale. I managed to keep along very well until 1858, when I was attacked by fever and ague. I had suffered very severely, and for a long time, from this illness while a boy in Ohio. It lasted now over a year, and, while it did not keep me in the house, it did interfere greatly with the amount of work I was able to perform. In the fall of 1858, I sold out my stock, crops, and farming utensils at auction, and gave up farming. Four years of struggling had not paid pecuniarily. Poverty is not a pleasant school in which to be nurtured. Blessings upon those who do not grow harsh or discontented with its bitter lessons. To keep sunshine in the face when want knocks at the heart is to win the victory in a dreadful battle. And yet many are able to accomplish this, and brighten with their happy faces lives more prosperous than their own. In the winter of 1858, 
Captain Grant established a partnership with a cousin of his wife in the real estate business. Again separation came. The little family were left on the farm, while the father tried another method of earning a living for them. Our business, he says, might have become prosperous if I had been able to wait for it to grow. As it was, there was no more than one person could attend to, and not enough to support two families. While a citizen of St. Louis, and engaged in the real estate agency business, I was a candidate for the office of county engineer, an office of respectability and emolument which would have been very acceptable to me at that time. The incumbent was appointed by the county court, which consisted of five members. My opponent had the advantage of birth over me, he was a citizen by adoption, and carried off the prize. I now withdrew from the co-partnership with Boggs, and, in May 1860, removed to Galena, Illinois, and took a clerkship in my father's store. He was once more in the tannery business, which he had so hated when a boy. It was well that men and women are spurred to duty because somebody depends upon them for daily food, otherwise this life of often uncongenial labor would be unbearable. We rarely do what we like to do in this world. We do what the merciless goad of circumstance forces us to do. He is wise who goes to his work with a smile. The year 1860 opened upon a new era in this country. Slavery and anti-slavery had struggled together till the election of Abraham Lincoln to the presidency told that the decisive hour had come. The nation could no longer exist, half slave and half free. When Mr. Lincoln was inaugurated March 4, 1861, the southern states seceded, one after another, until eleven had separated from the Union. Most of the southern forts were already in the hands of the Confederates. Fort Sumter, in the harbor of Charleston, still remained under the control of the Union. While besieged by the South, an effort was made to send supplies to our starving garrison. The fort was fired upon April 11, 1861, and that shot, like the one at Concord, was heard round the world. From that hour, slavery was doomed. The President issued his first call for 75,000 volunteers for 90 days. The North and West seemed to respond as one man. The intense excitement reached the little town of Galena. The citizens were at once called together. Business was suspended. In the evening the courthouse was packed. Captain Grant was asked to conduct the meeting. The people naturally turned to one who understood battles when they saw war close at hand. With much embarrassment Grant presided. The leather business was finished for him from that eventful night. The women of Galena were as deeply interested as the men. They came to Grant to obtain a description of the United States uniform for infantry, subscribed and bought the material, procured tailors to cut the garments, and made them with their own willing hands. More and more, with their superior education, women are to play an important part in this country, both in peace and war. Captain Grant was now asked by Governor Yates of Illinois to go into the Adjutant General's office and render such assistance as he could, which position he accepted, but he modestly says, I was no clerk, nor had I any capacity to become one. The only place I ever found in my life to put a paper so as to find it again was either a side coat pocket or in the hands of a clerk or secretary more careful than myself. But I had been quartermaster, commissary, and adjutant in the field. The army forms were familiar to me, and I could direct how they should be made out. Though a man of few words, those few could be effective if Grant chose to use them. Meeting in St. Louis, in a streetcar, a young braggart, who said to him, Where I come from, if a man dares to say a word in favor of the Union, we hang him to a limb of the first tree we come to. Grant replied, We are not so intolerant in St. Louis as we might be. I have not seen a single rebel hung yet, nor heard of one. There are plenty of them who ought to be, however. The young man did not continue the conversation. In May, 1861, Grant wrote a letter to the Adjutant General of the Army of Washington, saying that, as he had been in the regular army for fifteen years, and educated at government expense, he tendered his services for the war. No notice was ever taken of the letter, and of course no answer was returned. Soon after he spent a week with his parents in Covington, Kentucky. Twice he called upon Major General McClellan, at Cincinnati, just across the river, whom he had known slightly in the Mexican War with the hope that he would be offered a position on his staff. But he failed to see the general and returned to Illinois. He was not to serve under McClellan. A different destiny awaited him. 
President Lincoln now called for 300,000 men to enlist for three years or the war. Governor Yates appointed Grant Colonel of the 21st Illinois Regiment. Another separation from wife and children had come. The beginning of a great career had come also. The regiment repaired to Springfield, Illinois, and after some time spent in drill, was ordered to move against Colonel Thomas Harris, encamped at the little town of Florida. There was no bravado in the man who had fought so bravely in all the battles of the Mexican War. He says, As we approached the brow of the hill from which it was expected we could see Harris's camp, and possibly find his men ready formed to meet us, my heart kept getting higher and higher, until it felt to me as though it was in my throat. I would have given anything then to have been back in Illinois, but I had not the moral courage to halt and consider what to do. I kept right on. When we reached a point from which the valley below was in full view, I halted. The place where Harris had been encamped a few days before was still there, and the marks of a recent encampment were plainly visible, but the troops were gone. My heart resumed its place. It occurred to me at once that Harris had been as much afraid of me as I had been of him. This was a view of the question I had never taken before, but it was one I never forgot afterwards. From that event to the close of the war, I never experienced trepidation upon confronting an enemy, though I always felt more or less anxiety. I never forgot that he had as much reason to fear my forces as I had his. The lesson was valuable. Soon after this, Lincoln asked the Illinois delegation in Congress to recommend some citizens of the state for the position of Brigadier General, and Grant, to his great surprise, was recommended first on a list of seven. After his appointment, he spent several weeks in Missouri, whither he had been ordered. His first battle was at Belmont, where, in a severe engagement of four hours, the loss of our side was 485, and the Confederate loss 642. Grant's horse was shot under him. After the battle, the Confederates received reinforcements, and there was danger that our men could not return to the transports on which they had come to Belmont. We are surrounded, they cried. Well, said their cool leader, if that be so, we must cut our way out as we cut our way in. And so they did. Grant, meantime, rode out into a cornfield alone to observe the enemy. While there, as he afterwards learned, the southern General Polk and one of his staff saw the Union soldier and said to their men, There is a Yankee. You may try your marksmanship on him if you wish. But strangely enough, nobody fired, and Grant's valuable life was spared. He soon perceived that he was the only man between the Confederates and the boats. His horse seemed to realize the situation. Grant says, There was no path down the bank, and everyone acquainted with the Mississippi River knows its banks, in a natural state, do not vary at any great angle from the perpendicular. My horse put his fore foot over the bank without hesitation or urging, and, with his hind feet well under him, slid down the bank and trotted aboard the boat, twelve or fifteen feet away, over a single gangplank. I dismounted and went at once to the upper deck. When I first went on deck, I entered the captain's room, adjoining the pilot house, and threw myself on a sofa. I did not keep that position a moment, but rose to go out on the deck to observe what was going on. I had scarcely left when a musket ball entered the room, struck the head of the sofa, passed through it, and lodged in the boat. Thus again was his life saved. Until February of the following year, 1862, little was done by the troops, except to become ready for the great work before them. The enemy occupied strong points on the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, at Forts Henry and Donelson, points as essential to us as to them. These Grant determined to take, if possible. Truly, said President Lincoln, wherever Grant is, things move. I have noticed that from the beginning. On February 2nd, the expedition started against Fort Henry, with about 17,000 men. Several gunboats under Commodore Foote accompanied the army. At a given hour, the troops and gunboats moved together the one to invest the garrison, the other to attack the fort. After a severe fight of an hour and a half, every gun was silenced. General Lloyd Tilgeman surrendered, with his seventeen heavy guns, ammunition, and stores. Fort Donelson must now be taken, strongly fortified as it was. It stood on high ground, with rifle pits running back two miles from the river, and was defended by fifteen heavy guns, two carronades, and seventy-five pieces of artillery. Outside the rifle pits, trees had been felled, so that the tops lay toward the attacking army. Our men had to shelter from the snow and rain in this midwinter siege. No campfires could be allowed where the enemy could see them. In the march from Fort Henry to Fort Donelson, numbers of the tired troops had thrown away their blankets and overcoats, and there was much real suffering. 
but war means discomfort and woe as well as death itself. At three o'clock, February 14th, Commodore Foote's gunboats attacked the water batteries, and after a severe encounter, several of them were disabled. The one upon which the Commodore stood was hit about sixty times, one shot killing the pilot, carrying away the wheel, and wounding the commander. The night came on intensely cold. The next morning the enemy, taking heart, came against the national forces to cut their way out. Then Grant rode among his men, saying, Whichever party first attacks now will whip, and the rebels will have to be very quick if they beat me. Fill your cartridge boxes quick, and get into line. The enemy is trying to escape, and he must not be permitted to do so. Our men worked their way through the abatis of trees, took the outer line of rifle pits, and bivouacked within the enemy's lines. A driving storm of snow and hail set in, and many soldiers were frozen on that dismal night. There must have been little sleep, amid the firing of the Confederate pickets and the groans of the wounded on that frozen ground. During the night the Confederate generals, Floyd and Pillow, left the fort with three thousand men and Forrest with another thousand. On the morning of February 16th, Brigadier General S. B. Buckner sent a note to General Grant, suggesting an armistice. The following reply was returned at once. Sir, yours of this date, proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation, is just received. No terms except an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. From that day, U.S. Grant became to the people of the North unconditional surrender grant. Precious words, indeed, to the army as well as the people, to whom decisive action meant peace at last. General Butner considered the terms ungenerous and unchivalrous, but he surrendered his sixty-five guns, seventeen thousand six hundred small arms, and nearly fifteen thousand troops. Our loss in killed, wounded, and missing was about two thousand. The Confederate loss was believed to be about twenty-five hundred. This victory, the first great victory of the war, caused much rejoicing at the North, and Grant was at once made Major General of Volunteers. Two weeks from this time, he was virtually under arrest for not conforming to orders which he never received, but he was soon restored to his position. The country was to learn later, what Lincoln learned early in the war, that one head for an army is better than several heads. The next great battle under Grant was at Shiloh, near Pittsburgh Landing. On the morning of April 6, 1862, the Confederates, under General Attorney Sidney Johnston and Beauregard, rushed upon the national lines. All day Sunday the battle raged, and at night the Union forces had fallen back a mile in the rear of their position in the morning. Sherman, who commanded the ridge on which stood the long meeting house of Shiloh, was twice shot, once in the hand and once in the shoulder, a third ball passing through his hat. Grant could well say of this brave officer, I never deemed it important to stay long with Sherman. During the night after the desperate battle, the rain fell in torrents upon the two armies, who slept upon their arms. General Grant's headquarters were under a tree, a few hundred yards back from the river. Some time after midnight, he says, growing restive under the storm and the continuous rain, I moved back to the log house under the bank. This had been taken as a hospital, and all night wounded men were brought in, their wounds dressed, a leg or an arm amputated, as the case might require, and everything being done to save life or alleviate suffering. The sight was more unendurable than encountering the enemy's fire, and I returned to my tree in the rain. In battle, the great general could look on men falling about him apparently unmoved. When the battle was over, he could not bear the sight of pain. The men revered him, because, while he led them into death, he almost surely led them into victory. End of chapter 9, part 1